Hey everybody and welcome to the closing remarks during AWS Innovate 2018. Uh, my name is Oliver Klein, I'm the Head of Emerging Technologies uh, in Asia Pacific. And I'm joined here by Dean Samuels, the Head of Solutions Architecture of Hong Kong, Taiwan. Dean, good to have you here. Uh, awesome to be here, Oli. Uh, I know we both work in the same uh, uh, office building in Hong Kong, yeah. but we do rarely see each other working on different <laughs> floors and traveling different countries. So it's awesome to be in Singapore with you uh, today. Absolutely. And we got a, a variety of demos prepared. So we brought a few props. We're going to have some live demos around it. Live um, demos, live, live demos. demos. So <laughs> knock on wood, let's see how they're running. Um, with that in mind, uh, you got the little Q&A section on the side. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them. They'll land on Dean's laptop and we're going to try to address uh, some of them at the end of this session. Now, I'm quite excited about AWS Innovate 2018. There were lots of different tracks, you know, tracks on how to build effectively, how to do data analytics, how to do machine learning. Uh, we had a look at migration things. Steen, what was your take on it? What were some of the interesting things? Um, actually, the last one that you mentioned around migration and specifically around migration strategy, uh, more and more we're seeing customers who are um, starting their journey or already on their journey of migrating a lot of their applications, their existing applications to the cloud. And um, when I first started at AWS uh, all those years ago, uh, a lot of the conversation with customers of why they were moving to a platform like AWS was purely because of cost, to reduce the cost of infrastructure services that they could leverage for their applications and really only pay for what they need. But then over time, we, customers started to see that the true advantage of uh, a cloud platform like AWS is actually the agility it brings. Yeah. The ability to deploy, build, test applications very quickly, and most importantly, get those feedback loops from your own customers, your own users, on how you can improve the overall customer experience with your applications. But as I start to have uh, conversations now with um, some enterprise uh, customers, as well as some of the startups, mm. security is actually key. And so they see that the cloud brings value around security and enhanced security, where they can actually start building security at every single uh, level of their uh, applications, the deployment strategies, and so on. So the migration uh, strategy uh, track was really of interest. We fo focused on, for example, our partners like SAP and Microsoft and how you can actually deploy or migrate the existing workloads you might have on premise, which can be mission critical uh, type environments into, uh, into the cloud. We also spoke about how we work very closely with VMware and the VMware cloud service on AWS, where customers can actually run their on-premise VMware infrastructure and integrate it with VMware running on AWS infrastructure as well. So you have that seamless um, integration in a hybrid capacity with VMware. Yeah. Um, what about yourself, talking about data. Um, you know, we have uh, a common term about data has gravity, Ollie. Um, you know, the more data you put in somewhere, the more um, services and applications that it tracks. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think there's overall a data-centric point when we look at applications nowadays. Uh, data helps us to understand our customers, our users a little bit better. It allows us to customize the experience, personalize the experience, uh, run more streamlined businesses and applications. And I think at some of our tracks, we looked at things like how to build a data like on top of AWS, you know, how do we leverage Amazon S3 and what are the services that we need to attach around it to really build a data analytics pipeline around it? Uh, how can we, you know, run reports in the past to maybe potentially so completely serverless or go all the way to real-time data processing uh, as data comes in, get insights out of it and then use potentially machine learning uh, to make predictions on what would be the right thing or the next best action uh, for our end user. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dean, when we talk about data lakes, one of the other things that I'd say is, you know, very often it starts with data that sits somewhere mm -hmm. in a database, right? right? And so one of the other things that I found was interesting uh, we talked a lot about databases earlier today. There are so many different options, right? Absolutely. You know, the database still does remain in a lot of applications, one of the core components um, in that application. But, you know, just like a musician wouldn't use one in instrument to compose music or a song, uh, builders on AWS or builders on the cloud shouldn't be typically looking at one uh, tool to fit every type of use case. And so that applies to databases as well. And so today we covered a wide range of different database options that you have access access to, to run and host your um, various applications. So we spoke about relational databases using the um, R RDS service, the relational database service. So these are um, uh, database um, uh, services that provides that ACID compliance, that ability to um, securely and consistently and atomically um, store and, and uh, access your um, 
banking transactions, for example, this highly relational structured type information. But not all data is like that. So we also have options around NoSQL databases, really designed for high throughput, low latency type access. So for example, things like product catalogs. And one of the very interesting topics today, uh, Ollie, was around the Neptune uh, mm. service that we recently launched. Yeah. It's all about graph databases, right? That's right? So these graph databases really represent a highly sophisticated network relationship between these different objects that, yes, you could actually store and access in something like a relational database, but that will re re result in quite a large amount or sophisticated amount of things like joins in your queries. Mm. And yeah. what that does is it takes focus away on building your applications and try to set up these complex uh, uh, queries. So some interesting yeah. topics there. And in that regard, I think the other element that we'll find around graph databases pretty much is, uh, you know, applications are changing, right? The way we build applications, especially when we talk about things like social media, etc., very often these relations between entities really matter. And the way we design applications has changed in that regard, but I would say even the way we actually develop applications, right? Our end users actually expect that we bring in new features and functionalities relatively quickly. Uh, as a software developer, we want to be agile, we want to move fast, we want to be able to roll out deployments quickly, but also test them against each other, right? Have the ability of doing an A-B test, see is that new feature a little bit better than the other, should I roll back, should I roll forward? And overall, the, the way we develop software has become a lot more agile. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we are actually able to do that is because because we now have the right tools and also services from an AWS perspective here in place that allows us to be so agile in, in how we're building applications. And mm -hmm. so, Dean, in that regard, you know, we often talk about things like uh, CI, CD pipeline. Yeah. Right. Yep, do you want to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, so you mentioned uh, some really important keywords there, CICD pipelines. You mentioned about agile development. You, know, you mentioned things um, around, um, uh, you know, the ability to uh, do things very quickly, get that feedback loop and actually roll out new changes or iterate um, very fast. And so the key to all of that is actually around automation. You know, providing the ability for software developers to develop their code and from check-in to deployment, uh, mm. everything in between is actually automated. That includes things like testing, building, uh, deployment, um, and then get it also getting that feedback loop, getting feedback from your users of the platform on how you can best make changes to enhance that customer experience and then innovate or iterate yeah. very quickly on that. And so like Ollie mentioned, we spoke about today uh, a lot of the AWS tools, developer tools that actually allow you to do that. Now, whether it's things like code commit, so the ability to set up these private repositories for a version control system for your software, or whether it's things like code, code build, code deploy, code pipeline. So these are various services that can work well on their own, but also integrate very nicely to build those CICD pipelines that you were, you were uh, talking yeah. about, Ollie. So there's a wide range of these developer tools that are already built into the AWS platform that cu customers can choose to use, but then also integrate with existing tools that they yeah. might use today. Exactly. And you know, if I look at something like this, I'm a developer, Dean, I know you're more of an and I'm infrastructure guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, that's why we work so well together. Right? Yeah, exactly. We have to be like carrying you around or something, and you, know, you run very nicely on me. <laughs> well, you get the rugby arms yeah. on you, so there you go. But yeah, I love to, to develop my code, yeah. and so uh, I love the fact that we got Cloud9, right? If you're not familiar with Cloud9, uh, it, it's an IDE that allows us really to build our code uh, in an IDE that's in a browser, in a cloud environment, making a lot of sharing and collaboration a lot easier and being able to that, deploy that out straight away. We had a great session earlier uh, that talked about how we can do that even to build serverless applications, uh, but even in the sense of what if I want to build a mobile application, right? Uh, we had a session that talked about how to build a mobile applications in just a few minutes using services such as the mobile hub. And what the mobile hub allows us to do, we can say, I want to create a mobile application. I just click together the features and functionalities that I want to have. I want to have some login. I want to have some analytics. I want to have some storage uh, 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 or a service on, on my AWS environment, etc. And what it will do, it will provision all the necessary services in AWS, but more importantly, it will provide me with a full sample application, the entire code that I now can take and say either way I extend those capabilities of that application or I maybe use it as, you know, the way I develop, copy, paste stuff over, right? <laughs> right. Is that the secret? That's the secret, That's I the see. Secret. That's the secret. Standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. And right. you know, one of the other things that I would say is, you know, we, we talk about code and development and that's great, but yep. sometimes, you know, when you create an experience, it doesn't always require you 
to actually write code. Yeah, and so if you think about experiences, um, I want to put a highlight on Amazon Sumerian. So Amazon Sumerian is actually a service that allows us to create 3D virtual reality and augmented reality experiences right in the browser. Right. And it also integrates then with other services such as Amazon Lex or Amazon Polly that allows us to create intelligent voice responses, create an assistant, there's a Sumerian host to whom we can talk and who can respond back, but we can also create logic by dragging and dropping things in. Okay, that, that's quite interesting and, and hopefully you've got a demo uh, for that because it's interesting to me because as an infrastructure guy, like you mentioned before, you know, I'm not really deep on the actual lines of code. You know, yeah. I know enough code to be uh, dangerous, I must admit, you know, but I don't want to focus on those sort of things. I want to be able to have that more visual experience uh, developing my workflows um, and doing a drag and drop type fashion, sort of like a what you see is what you get. Um, sure. So maybe you can... Uh, well, yeah, so I got my laptop connected here to the screen, so uh, let's switch over here to the Amazon Sumerian console. Uh, so what you see here is the console of Amazon Sumerian. You can see it's an, it's an IDE, but it's also visual in the sense that I can now actually click onto the different objects. I can give them properties. So let me start off by clicking onto my Amazon Sumerian host here. And if you look closely right here on the side, there are certain components that pop up based on uh, the, based on the object that I selected. In this scenario, we have, for example, the dialogue component. So that's mm. the integration with Amazon Lex, where I integrated it with Lexbot, uh, a bot named Lexbot here, that allows me to create an interaction with the Sumerian hosts. Or when I mentioned Amazon Polly, if we scroll down a little bit, you can see that I have a speech integration that allows me to have some pre-created speeches that are rendered now using Amazon Polly to create a voice, and I chose the voice of Amy right here, and so we right. can bring our character to life. So let me try this out by actually um, going here on the play button on at the bottom. And what if I just click that? Uh, what will happen is it will actually start loading the scene for me. Let me just click uh, click the play button. If I click on the play button, it will start loading the scene, and I actually put in an initial speech. My name is Candy, and I'm here to assist you today. I am an Amazon Sumerian host and I'm integrated with Amazon Lex to I love the mouse movements along with the words and like it's following me or following your, your, your movements as Correct. well. And you yeah. don't have to program any of that in, right? That's it's right. So all of the, the gestures that she does, yeah. uh, we use uh, natural language understanding to right. propose certain speech marks on what gestures, gesture marks, what gestures which she will do depending on what she's saying. And as you correctly noted, if I turn around my camera, you can see that she's actually following with her eyes because mm. the default setting here, the default logic would be to have the camera or basically have her look at the camera specifically here. Um, now, you might say, okay, well, but what if I want to create my own kind of flow logic in here? So if I click on tools and I open up my state machine and state machine down here and I go onto one of the state machines that I created, you can see that if I zoom in, uh, we can have a certain flow logic where we drag and drop the kind of things that we want to have and how they change over time uh, uh, just into that state machine. So right now we're actually waiting for input. Mm -hmm. um, I was a bit lazy. I just said, Let, let's create a very simple demo. Sure. So I said, if I type a certain key press on my keyboard, I will actually play another speech. Let me just try this out. So if I hit Q, this is a cute speech for our AWS Innovate closing. You session. can now see we have the state so here. Like it's the uh, it's greenly marked, and now the state jumped back onto the wait for input. So we can also visually see mm. how that is now playing down, and then we can drag and drop things and change that logic around any way we would like to have. Well, it's right? pretty pretty awesome the fact that you can uh, you know do all this, create this. A fairly sophisticated type uh, application. Impress all your, your your friends and colleagues so you can build this sort of thing in literally a, you know a matter of maybe minutes or hours to actually build something like this. It's just a matter of creating these these different uh, different flows. That's right. You mentioned before though about integrating some of the Amazon um, web services uh, technologies like uh, mm -hmm. Lex and Polly and, and others. Now, but what about third party? You know, we have a lot of yep. um, users of the platform that have these their own services that they might want to integrate with Sumerian. Mm -hmm. um, what are the options around that? Yeah, so what I haven't shown here yet, but there are components on the right side that would allow me to actually run or integrate it with a script. So you can actually put a script into your Sumerian experience, and that script could run, for example, JavaScript. And in that sense, I have the option to then use that JavaScript code to then integrate it with other third parties, or the other way around, have another third party integrate into my Sumerian experience, really giving me also the possibility, if I actually want to code, right. I can. 
and extend that that kind of logic. Right, right. It's a win-win situation for me and you, right? Correct. Right. You drag and drop it together, <laughs> I'll put the code in. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And, and one of the reasons I asked about that third party is because uh, we have services that allow customers to build their own um, set of services, whether it's through APIs or whatever type of uh, interfaces they want to use. And so That's being right. able to integrate it quite seamlessly with things like Sumerian just makes it a lot easier for customers to take advantage of some of these managed uh, services. Yeah. When it comes to their own third party um, or their own custom applications that they want to run, let's talk a little bit about some of the compute engines mm -hmm. that will allow them to do that. Um, so I'm sure most of our listeners out there or viewers out there know about the um, Amazon EC2 um, service. It's essentially a, a, a virtual machine service that allows you to run your Linux and Windows uh, based um, virtual machines and then you have the flexibility to run whatever type of applications, whatever type of software you prefer on top of that, uh, uh, that particular environment. Now EC2 has been around for quite some time, in fact it was actually the, uh, one of the first um, services that we launched in 2006. Yeah. On the spot quiz, what were the other two? So there was uh, Amazon S3. Yeah, that's a uh, given. That's an easy Most one. Most people know that <laughs> yeah. one. And Amazon SQS. Exactly. And, and yeah. Amazon SQS <laughs> actually does stump a, a few people. But yeah. yeah, it was these infrastructure services that uh, we made available uh, to our customers, which will really allow them to build these very flexible, robust applications on top of the AWS platform itself. But over the years, we started to move further and further up the stack. And you can see that through the likes of things like, you know, Sumerian and Lex and Poly and a wide range of other that's um, right. uh, services. Uh, services Services, was, services yeah. as well. But of course, there's other ways that customers can run their own custom applications on the AWS platform. That's right. Talk us through that, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So there's this great concept of containerization, which I, as a developer, really like because I'm the, I can develop something on my laptop, I put it in a container, I run it there, I'm happy with it, and then I can ship it uh, onto my EC2 instance yeah. if I want. And we wanted to make that easier for customers. So a while ago, we launched the Elastic Container Service that allows you to run your container fully managed in an AWS environment, you just click your cluster together and then you can schedule, uh, schedule it into that cluster. Uh, a lot of our customers, although I've said that's great, love it, but uh, sometimes I actually want to use Kubernetes. Kubernetes yeah. is, a, is a great open source very tool, popular. like to yeah. use it, yeah. very popular. Uh, could you make that easier for us? And so uh, we launched the Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, uh, yeah. mouthful, yeah, so in is. short, we often abbreviate it as EKS uh, in short. And again, here the ability to quickly uh, push your container uh, out into the AWS environment. Now, our mission is always to think about, we want to give you the flexibility, the choice, the freedom of choosing what do you want to use, do you want Kubernetes, do you want ECS, uh, it's up to you. Um, but we also want to make it easier for our customers to build fast and say, well, with an Elastic Container Service, you still need to define the EC2 instance for your, mm. for your, con for your uh, uh, cluster. Yep. Uh, so could we make that easier for you? And so uh, we launched AWS Fargate, which basically allows you to run your container in the AWS environment, and we fully manage how that works, right? So you don't need to think about the underlying infrastructure at all. Right, so you just focus on your container specs and don't worry about how many servers you need underneath to support Correct. It. And then Correct. you have that scalability option as well. Exactly, right? exactly. And so if, if you think about something like this, that really goes into the concept of serverless, right? Like mm. basically uh, abstract away the underlying service to make it for me as a developer and as a builder much easier to say, I just want to have my code being run for me. So one other option that we have is to use AWS Lambda. Now if you're not familiar with AWS Lambda, it allows you to run your piece of code fully managed in the AWS environment, right? We take care of the high availability, uh, we make sure that it scales on, based on the upcoming incoming events. Um, but you know, Dean, what I'm most excited about is um, we actually only charge you for the execution time right. of your code. That's awesome. Right. Yeah, it's that pay for what you need type model, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that makes it really easy for me. And I can build something, you know, something sits there and waits for the next million user, but I only get charged if they actually pop up, mm -hmm. right? And then the other thing that I'm quite uh, uh, intrigued about by AWS Lambda is a lot of people probably think about AWS Lambda in combination with Amazon's API Gateway, mm -hmm. which allows you to build that microservice kind of architecture. So that's one way to actually trigger your AWS piece of code, sorry, AWS Lambda a piece of code, but the other way would be to have any kind of event trigger. And so an event trigger can be, for example, I have a new file in my Amazon S3 bucket. Could be I have a new item in my DynamoDB table or there's an update in my DynamoDB table. And you know, as of lately, we just mentioned SQS earlier, mm -hmm. as of lately, you can also have an event trigger from your SQS queue when there's right. a message 
in your SQS queue, mm -hmm. an AWS Lambda function is being triggered, and your piece of code runs based on right. that message. That's, that's awesome. So, so um, this, you know, this, the whole serverless uh, idea sounds really fascinating to me because it does allow our customers to really focus on their logic and their applications uh, themselves. But as you know, Ollie, a lot of our customers can't deploy everything into the cloud. There's going to be certain situations where they might want to run something, you know, more locally or, or, or on the edge. Um, right. So one of the interesting things that I think is important to, to understand is AWS Lambda allows you to run a Lambda function fully managed in an AWS cloud cloud environment. Mm -hmm. But in certain scenarios, especially when we're in a remote area where we have intermittent connectivity, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be great if we could push some of that logic out onto the edge for certain use cases mm -hmm. and then bring only that information back into my cloud environment whenever I have connectivity or whenever it makes sense for me. And so there's this service called AWS Greengrass that helps us with some of this. And I figured, uh, Dean, you, you're pretty good with Whiteboards, right? Uh, uh, apparently, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great solutions. Well, used to be. Yeah. <laughs> so I figured, you know, you could maybe help us understand AWS Greengrass a little bit better by drawing out some of the components. And you know, it just so happens I selected the room uh, with the whiteboard. Yeah. Got the whiteboard. Right? You got the whiteboard markers. You've tested them. I tested them. <laughs> They're, They're all good. there. Okay. So. Dean, um, do you mind trying for us a little bit on how AWS Greengrass looks oh, and uh, what, it, what it can do for us? And I want to test Dean on his uh, whiteboard <laughs> skills here. There you go. Um, yeah, so you know uh, the um, AWS Greengrass um, service. It's essentially a set of uh, sort of a, like a development kit that you can deploy software that you can deploy onto uh, hardware devices. So uh, it could be x86 or ARM-based um, devices right now with certain amount of memory. Where you deploy this uh, particular piece of software that will start to bring a lot of the AWS services that you'd normally run in a region or in the cloud onto your edge uh, edge location. And this is quite exciting um, uh, for our for our customers. It's something that we've been hearing a lot from our customers, the capability to bring some of these services to the edge. Now this uh, diagram that uh, Ollie nicely drew up for me a little bit <laughs> earlier, um, uh, it's given me a bit of a head start, really represents what uh, a uh, traditional IoT solution would actually look like. Where on the right hand side you have your things, you know, your, your devices, your sensors, your various um, hardware that's collecting real world information and reporting it into a particular service for further analysis, for storage and then to do other things maybe at a later time. Um, now, let's say, for example, you had a set of sensors or a set of devices that were running in a remote mining uh, site. Um, one of the problems with that is that the connectivity from those sensors to the AWS platform may be inconsistent. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of disruption or it actually can be very costly. Yeah. Um, and basically what uh, happens there is it's uh, the law of economics, um, one of the three laws I'm going to talk about gets impacted with this type of setup. And when we yeah. talk about the laws of economics, we're talking about cost. Um, we're not, uh, the, the remote mining site might not be fortunate enough to be in Hong Kong. I don't yeah. think there's actually any mining sites in Hong Kong <laughs> for that matter, uh, where Ollie and I are, um, yeah. where we have access great to internet, great, great internet, internet very, very cheap, right. yeah. very yeah. consistent, very reliable, <laughs> right? Um, so we need a way to um, allow our customers to have these various sensors on this mining environment. Maybe it's reporting, for example, information on the heavy equipment there when it needs maintenance rather than just scheduling it, it's therefore saving costs. But we need a way for these sensors to actually communicate in a more cost-effective, reliable way to the cloud and maybe even communicate with each other as well and so therefore reducing this round mm -hmm. trip. And that actually leads me to the next law, the law of physics. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you've got your sensors that are built into your car because you're building an autonomous driving solution in the car. Could you imagine if your car is communi constantly communicating with the cloud over a high latency connection to make decisions when to turn left or to turn right? It's simply not going to work. There's too much latency in involved there. Mm -hmm. So we want the ability for decisions to be made to turn left, to turn right, to brake that can be done in the car itself rather than relying on the cloud for those decisions. And so we need to overcome the law of physics, the law of latency. And then finally, imagine if you had things that were running in some type of hospital environment or a care facility which were providing health alerts if something happened to a particular patient. Um, having to connect to the cloud and actually send up personal or health information might be against the actual policy or the regulation for that actual organization. Now, even though we do have a lot of health uh, customers, we work with government, for example, that are, that are running sensitive content in the cloud, there may be situations where very specific workloads mm -hmm. can, uh, the data or the content can never leave um, the edge or the local environment. So we need to overcome that, that's all right. of those three laws. And that's where the green grass comes in. Right. 
So green grass, as I mentioned, as a service, is something you deploy into these um, uh, devices. One of the components of Greengrass is the Greengrass Core. And Greengrass Core introduces a couple of uh, components that can be used at the edge. The first one, which is really exciting, and what uh, Ollie alluded to before, yeah. is Lambda. So being able to run your logic locally here at the edge rather than at the service in the cloud. So you can have certain application logic that's going to be processing information, maybe doing the certain encryption, maybe doing anonymizing, whatever you like to that actual content, and also even integrating with maybe uh, different types of peripherals that might exist on the device itself. So things like serial ports, USB ports, and other things as well. The second thing it provides is uh, what we call the message broker. So basically what this allows us to do is have the things uh, communicate with each other through this message broker. So you can think of it like a message router. So we can have this thing up here, for example, communicating to this one here using protocols like MQTT, so a lightweight, right. uh, lightweight protocol. The advantage is obviously we're not going all the way to the cloud and coming, uh, coming back here. Um, we can also set up um, various topics because it uses a published mm -hmm. subscriber model, a pub sub model, in order to do that. So we can have subset of things belonging to each topic so we can be very specific which messages get actually routed um, other places. And Dean, if I'm not mistaken, that also allows us to say maybe some of these messages might flow back to our AWS cloud environment while others would talk to the devices itself, is that correct? Exactly right, absolutely, that's a, that's a right. great point. Where you have total control over what type of content is actually um, sent outside of your own local network. And then we have the device shadows. And this is all about being able to maintain the state of all of your things. So remember, this could be literally millions or billions of these sensors that are actually running or devices that are running mm -hmm. as part of your things. So we need a way to make sure that all of these devices' status is kept up to date. The device might, to be run, might need to be running at 100% for some reason, or 5%, or 10%, or maybe turned off. The device itself may be turned, uh, turned off for a certain period of time and then turned on. And so what we can actually do is update the device shadow, uh, which is essentially like a JSON uh, file, which represents the state of every single device. So the next time the device checks in, so even if there was a disconnection, which can occur, this device can actually update itself to the authoritative state that's represented in the device uh, shadow. Um, the device shadow component can also synchronize with the IoT service uh, device uh, shadow too. Now the one that really excites me, Ollie, is nice. something we recently launched, which is the ability for the Greengrass core to do inferencing. And inferencing machine is learning. machine learning. Okay? We can't have a uh, topic without uh, machine learning and deep learning. And so the idea here is, rather than having to run all of your uh, deep learning or machine learning models in the cloud, because, uh, for example, autonomous cars, you can't do that. You want to run it locally on the, on the core itself. Um, the inference component allows you to do all your training in the cloud. But once you've built that model, you can actually deploy the model into Greengrass Core. Okay. And so, of course, we've got a recent launch of a service called SageMaker, which makes it very easy to do all your training of models, and, and Ollie will talk about it in a moment, where we can train it in the cloud, we can use all of the high capacity, high, um, uh, uh, high uh, capacity hardware that is available in the cloud, do the, all the training, but then deploy the actual model itself right here. Onto the green grass. Green and then of course, grass. finally, like we mentioned, we have a choice of sending data to the MQTT service, sorry, to the IoT service, which is MQTT, which in turn, using a rules engine, can actually process which services in AWS, whether it's Lambda, S3, Dynamo, and so on, can actually be used to store, analyze, or um, do whatever you like with the data. And then, of course, communicate directly back with the green grass call. Fantastic, fantastic. And Dean, I, I love the fact that you drew that up because uh, it helps me with explaining this Absolutely. little device a little bit better. This is an AWS Deep Lens, and if you're not familiar with it, it is actually a developer tool that allows us uh, to actually build computer vision models. So it's equipped with a little camera in the front, and it is actually running a green grass core inside here. There you go. And now what, what that allows us to do, it allows us to either way choose some of the pre-curated templates that we have, or we can build our own uh, machine learning models, 
notably, for example, using Amazon SageMaker to perform certain computer vision activity. Uh, that gets packaged in a Lambda function. That Lambda function gets sent over using Greengrass onto the Greengrass core of that deep lens itself. And then it runs there to make predictions, such as, for example, recognizing faces, recognizing objects. But the key point is it fully runs then in this deep lens device. And if we want, some of the information we can synchronize back into my cloud environment. But the inference itself is done on the device, right? That's pretty cool. So you brought a prop. And there we go. You got I had to bring a prop one. too. So you, you you spoke about you know things like uh, uh, object and facial recognition with things like the, uh, the the deep lens. Now that's one way of having a natural interaction with technology, natural inter interaction with uh, with various services. Yeah. Uh, a lot of our viewers will probably recognise this device. So this is the Amazon Echo. This is the original one. There's uh, different iterations now, but the Amazon Echo is essentially uh, running a, a software or an ecosystem of uh, our Alexa skills or our Alexa platform. And what this actually allows you to do is, in a very natural way, interface with a service or set of services using natural speaking. And what I mean by that is, you don't need to actually rephrase statements or you don't have to talk in a very specific way like you had to do with previous old voice recognition or voice detection type uh, technology. With the advances in mm. deep learning, um, you can talk in a very natural way, even if you have a strong accent like myself with my Australian accent, which can be sometimes hard to understand. My Alexa Echo, my Amazon Echo device understands me very easily when I give it uh, commands. And it really mm. allows me to make it easier, for example, for my parents to, uh, to start accessing and integrating with services. So if they want to order a Domino's yeah. pizza, rather than having to do it on the phone, uh, because they, they're not technically savvy like we are, and they don't like using applications on the phone. It took me a while to actually teach them how to use a <laughs> smartphone. But they can actually inter interface at home with the Echo and say, Am uh, Alexa, please order me a pizza. And then 30 minutes or less, it'll be delivered to your door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's great new ways of actually creating new interfaces for end consumers to use. It's also a great example of something of certain logic which sits at the, at the edge location, mm -hmm. right? If you're not familiar on the way uh, uh, Alexa voice services works, you actually need to trigger it using a, a wake word, which is the default is Alexa. Well, that wake word listening mm -hmm. is happening on the device, right? But then the command and all the skills yep. behind it, they are happening in my cloud environment. Yep. But I like your point about creating a new experience and also mm. creating a new channel of interacting with consumers a little bit more naturally. Yep. And you know, there's one thing that, uh, that I just recently bought and I find quite interesting, mm -hmm. you know, like there are new ways of interacting with stuff, right? Absolutely. There are new ways of creating new interfaces instead of just having mouse and keyboards. Mm. Um, I, got a, I got a Mio armband here and this one is pretty cool because it's actually equipped, if you look at it, it's equipped with basically sensors here that can track uh, the electricity that goes through my muscles and with that I'm able to actually perform certain activity and commands to do certain that things. So, so cool. for example <laughs> if you do give a presentation you can just say next slide, previous slide, wow. next slide, right? <laughs> or scroll something down or scroll up yeah. or go around it and I just have a band. It's like a to telekinesis, it's right? like you do it with your mind but you're, wow that's pretty cool. How cool is that? And I'm just thinking ahead, you know, think about all the, the great new things that we can do in the future, you know, uh, right now that might be an armband, in the future we might have different ways of an even integrate that thing into, into clothing, into, and things, yeah, clothing yeah. fabric, etc. Yeah. And again, power of obviously interpreting data and then using models around understanding, well, when I do this, you know, depending on my, my arm, my hand, mm. that, that is interpreted as that movement. In that regard, I also wanted to touch on something else. You know, earlier I talked about computer vision. Mm. Uh, we talked about object detection, for example, uh, yep. very useful in self-driving cars, etc. Mm. So a lot of our customers always ask me, you know, like, Object detection is great, you know, I, I actually want to build my own custom object detection model because I have a specific object like this mouse or what have you mm -hmm. that I always want to identify in, in picture or video material. And so just recently we actually launched uh, an inbuilt algorithm for Amazon SageMaker to perform object detection. Now what that means is you can actually right. just take pictures of a certain specific object, mm -hmm. right? You push it into Amazon SageMaker, you need a, a variety of different pictures, and you say that is, for example, this specific object. Amazon SageMaker will learn from it, and it can now not only identify that object, but it can tell you exactly where does that sit in the picture. Wow, that's pretty yeah. cool. So could you then take that SageMaker model and then deploy it onto a green grass, green grass to device? That's absolutely right. It all ties right, in, right? right? So yeah. you can do that inference on SageMaker itself because SageMaker is great to build, yep. train and deploy models on the cloud, but yep. also 
push it out to the edge and run. That's awesome. Parents. So you're basically yeah. building your own deep lens. You don't need that, to have the actual deep lens that, itself. Well, actually, you can push yeah. it to your deep lens we'll and then push run the deep it. Lens. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so the other thing that I'd say is, you know, we we really want to put machine learning into the hands of every developer, any data scientist, any IT professional, pretty mm -hmm. much. And so the way we are doing that is also by having some of our fully managed machine learning services. We talked about Amazon Lax, mm -hmm. Poly, there are a few others like trans Transcribe and Translate, but there's also Amazon Recognition and Recognition Video, which allows us to actually use deep learning machine models that are pre-trained by Amazon uh, on image or video material to do things like facial analysis, facial mm -hmm. recognition, to do object detection and scene or activity detection. And I always say, you know, you can do that with a few clicks of a button, right? right? Mm -hmm. I figure, I actually should show that live so that people see it is a few clicks of a button. So, so. Let, me, uh, let me open up my Amazon recognition console here. Uh, this is just a normal AWS management console. And you can see on the side here we have, uh, if I click on facial analysis, we give you a variety of samples of facial analysis. But I say a few clicks of a button. Sure. Shall we try it out? Uh, yeah. I'm going to open a very sophisticated tool um, which is just my default webcam Built software into the here. Back, yeah. Built in, into the Mac. Okay, let, let, shall we take a picture let's together picture. now? Let's take a picture together. Three, two, one. Smile. There we go. <laughs> and now I'm going to drag this picture in into my folder here. And if I click upload, I'm going to upload this picture. So a click of a button, I'm uploading this picture. And now Amazon Recognition will try to analyze our faces, has detected them here, great. Mm -hmm. And it also provided us with a little bit oh, of I see. an analysis, right? There you go. So you, your face uh, looks like a face, uh, so that's, that's already a good, good. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good sign. sign. Yeah, we, I think we get the age range. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. right. yeah, towards yeah. the lower end, towards so, the so lower there end. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you appear to be happy. Uh, yeah, so very happy. Look very at happy. Yeah. It's innovate <laughs> time. We always like innovate yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. So, let me have a look at myself. Let's compare. I'm a little bit less happy. Oh, oh uh, okay. How does that come, Dean? You know why? It thinks I'm old. Oh, it does too. There you go. <laughs> so really, really uh, great things in the sense of like, with a click of a button, we get access to things like facial recognition, facial detection, object and scene detection, mm -hmm. etc. And I wanted to show you how easy that is. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's a really great example of that undifferentiated heavy lifting, removing that from the customer. Like you said, what we just actually demonstrated there is available to any user of the platform. There's no building of specialized applications. You just take a photo with it, whatever you do, um, whatever device you prefer, upload it to the recognition service in the console, and it can automatically do that analysis. So imagine if you start building applications that uh, can actually do that sort of thing and integrate with the APIs of yeah. recognition. That's where the true power starts coming out, coming out. The other thing that I wanted to talk about today is when we talk computer vision, we think about things like object detection, scene detection, etc. Mm -hmm. But one other interesting thing that you can do with computer vision is potentially to identify your hands and your right. hand movements, right? Mm -hmm. And so with me here, because I always like to look at some of the customers and companies out there that are building interesting things. And so there's a company called Leap Motion, and they built something called the Leap Motion uh, Controller. And what that Leap Motion Controller has is some infrared cameras here, and they can actually be used to identify my hand movements. Let me just show you what I mean with that. So I'm going to activate my Leap Motion Controller here, and I'm going to load the default visualizer of that Leap Motion Controller in. And you can see here that, that there's some infrared cameras here uh, that are basically tracking uh, me through the Leap Motion Controller, and if I use my hands on top of it, you can see that it's actually identifying my hands and its movements. So That's let pretty me cool. Take this away, see, uh, one finger out, drawing out, and we can now use computer vision to detect my hands and the motions around it, right? Imagine all the uh, use cases for that, you know. Reminds me of actually that movie Minority Report, right? Next one, yeah. next one. There you go, next one. You'll be yeah. carried away. Oh, right? absolutely. You're too, too distracted. <laughs> now, um, one of the uh, use cases that I can actually see for this is you demonstrated Sumerian uh, before for building your virtual reality That's right. um, platform. Is there a way that you could actually integrate a third-party um, device like this Leap Motion into something like Sumerian? So you can imagine that you are actually totally immersed in this world, this virtual reality world, and using this type of device to really interact without having to wear any specialized um, equipment. Absolutely. And if you look at something like the Leap Motion Controller, there's some frameworks out there, open source. For example, there's Leap.js that allows us uh, to understand these gestures that I do using JavaScript. And guess what? As I said earlier, you can integrate JavaScript 
JavaScript scripts into Amazon Sumerian and control right. it accordingly so we can actually build that integration as developer great for VR experience, and that's pretty much the direction that Leap Motion is right, going. Right, right. Yeah. So VR is having a resurgence, right? Absolutely, around. absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing, though, that I'm quite excited about is, you know, how about, for example, augmented reality? Because yeah. I think augmented reality is one of the other interesting, exciting things that also Sumerian can help us sure. to do. Yep. And so I figured, how about I show you a little bit of an example of a live augmented reality demo that is mm. powered through Amazon Sumeria. So I brought with me here a tablet, and I'm just gonna unlock my tablet here. Let's have a look into it. And I'm gonna bring up my browser, and on that browser I'm gonna load an Amazon Sumerian experience. So that's just a link, it comes off of CloudFront. And that Amazon uh, Sumerian experience here in the browser can actually tap onto your camera on the device itself and that would allow us to then create an augmented reality experience because we integrate it with something called AR.js that allows us to run an augmented reality experience in the browser itself. So if I go over this little specific marker here, the marker could be anything. In this scenario I chose a kind of QR code style of marker. You can see that we actually get an overlay of a 3D object from Amazon Sumerian and you can see that I can also obviously interface with that object here and it's also pretty reactive uh, to my movements itself. Now one other thing that Amazon Sumerian can do is it is actually integrated with AWS IoT mm. and uh, I gave you a link earlier Dean uh, with another uh, website that is also connected to my AWS IoT mm. and there's a little next button attached to it. So if you hit that next button, there you go, yeah. you can actually change my go. scene, <laughs> right? And I, I thought it would be a little bit uh, of fun to add one more scene. Can you hit that right. next button again? There we go. <laughs> yeah, a little nice. AWS mannequin that is dancing onto it. And again, I can interface with it to actually change its dance movement. A little bit of a Macarena yeah. here. Oh, yeah, I think, that's, <laughs> I think it's stolen your dance moves. <laughs> and you can see it's really, really fast and reactive of what we can do in a browser here. And if you think about it, this is a perfect example for us as builders you know, we have something in the browser, we integrate it with JavaScript, we integrate it with IoT, with something like Amazon and Sumerian to really create an interesting experience right here, live in our little studio. That's pretty cool. And so I think it's never really been a, a time to, a better time to be a builder because we have so many different things that we can combine together and it allows us to create interesting new experiences for our end users. Now, we actually did ask for a variety of questions. I saw that lots of, <laughs> they have lots of through, questions uh, coming yeah, through here. Absolutely. So how about, uh, how about we try to answer some of these? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, we are uh, uh, running on to time now, so we'll probably have enough time for about uh, two, uh, two questions, I'd say. Questions, yeah. um, so there's a question for you, Ollie, around AWS Lambda. You know, how scalable is AWS Lambda? You can imagine it could be running, you know, hundreds, thousands, even millions of, of these type of uh, functions and logic. So if I want to create an API service uh, with AWS API Gateway, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. and AWS Lambda, uh, Gurav asks us, um, you know, how scalable is it? Yeah. So a uh, great question in the sense of, well, how does that actually work when we talk about the scalability aspect of AWS Lambda? So if you tie it together with API Gateway, a single API call to your microservice would incur one function call in your AWS Lambda function. Now the, the functions itself can be parallelized. So if you have hundreds of calls coming in, then you have hundreds of parallel execution of that Lambda function. So when you design your AWS Lambda function, you look at a single call, that single function is one single execution call of your AWS Lambda, and when multiple calls are coming in, you have multiple parallel executions of those individual calls in your AWS Lambda function. Now there are some soft limits that are applied to your account. Default is only 100, um, but you can ask to increase that to any amount of throughput that you would like to have. And based on that integration with API Gateway, we automatically fan it out to the different AWS Lambda functions and execute them in parallel to make it work for you. Awesome. Um, so we have another question. This is regarding recognition. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Tanay Kumar asks, um, recognition on live video needs kinesis. 
Uh, can that be ported down to Greengrass Core? Yeah, so great question. So uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, so it was the name, Kumar. Yep. Uh, uh, absolutely great question in the sense of like, how do we use recognition, video recognition, video? Can use video files from an Amazon S3 bucket, but if we want to do it in real time, we integrate it generally with the Kinesis video streams. Now you asked if we could actually bring that to a Greengrass Core, bring it at the edge. Let me give you a good example of that. If you use our AWS plans here, it actually allows you to stream it to your Kinesis video stream also, mm -hmm. and then bring it to Amazon recognition. So perfect example of how that is being done through, uh, through a, a, such a green grass appliance, so to speak. Uh, but obviously, you can bring that into uh, any other green grass appliance that you would like. And that's actually a very common use case uh, to look into, you know, how could I stream some of the video back from, you know, video cameras that are hanging around and then try to analyze you know, the movements of people, for example. Sure. Um, we've got probably time for one last question. Um, okay. So we have a question from uh, uh, Chinaji. Um, Chinaji asks, um, how does the AWS cloud uh, integrate or support uh, VMware cloud? Um, maybe I'll take that. that Absolutely. One. Yeah, I know you've been, Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, might give, you, give yourself a rest. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, actually what I would recommend is we had a, um, a session today which, which specifically focused on this um, area about VMware cloud um, on AWS which is a service that's actually offered by VMware. And essentially what it is, is VMware technology is actually running on hardware that AWS is managing in specific regions around the globe. And so what that basically means is customers have access to the ability to run things like their virtual machines using a platform that they're very familiar with, in this case VMware. But it takes it one step further because the real advantage here is customers can actually set up their hybrid um, uh, type connectivity, so connecting their on-premise uh, locations or their colo um, uh, sites that is already running this VMware uh, infrastructure and actually integrate it with the VMware cloud on AWS platform running in a particular AWS region or regions of that mm -hmm. choice. And then they can actually start taking advantage of a lot of the VMware technology, live migration, for example, or vMotion, yeah. being able to actually move virtual machines from on-premise to the cloud and back again. And then the added advantage is once those um, virtual machines are running in the cloud, you can start integrating and accessing a lot of the other AWS services. And that's where the real power comes out. Fantastic. And so we're, we're unfortunately a little bit short in time. It's now 4.33 p.m. here in Singapore where we're recording this. Um, we're going to stay around for a while. There's the Ask the Expert booth. Please feel free to get in there, uh, ask any question that you might have. We're happily answering them. We've got an entire team of AWS experts too in there. Uh, apart from that, if you haven't had the chance to catch any of the earlier sessions, uh, we actually run this across multiple time zones. Mm -hmm. So there's actually going to be two more runs of this. So feel free to look at the latest sessions if you want to rewatch. Uh, some of the sessions that you didn't have the chance to attend because it was running at the same time. You got another opportunity there. And feel free to log in after this event again into the same console here. We will make some of the content available uh, uh, for a while. So with that in mind, uh, always a pleasure to have you Absolutely here, Dean. Absolutely pleasure to be uh, with you, Yoli. Great to talk to our viewers. I hope this was all insightful to you. Mm -hmm. Please ask any questions that you might have. And looking forward to seeing you on the next round of AWS Innovate. See you then. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.